JRPGs have been around for quite some time, and some are better than others, but which ones are the best? Only one way to find out. Let's hit it. When I started doing YouTube, my intention was just to show love for JRPGs I grew up with and maybe make a few friends along the way. I never even thought I'd make it to 100 subscribers, never mind a thousand. This video is thanks to all of you. Every view, every like, and every comment has kept me going. So I thank you from the deepest part of my heart. I mean that with every fiber of my being. Okay, that's enough of the sappy. I love JRPGs and I've been playing them for as long as I can remember. Today, I wanna talk about my personal favorite JRPG for every year since 1989. As a general rule of thumb, I'm using the initial first release. For most, this is a Japanese release, but for some of them, it might be a Europe or North American release. On top of that, keep in mind, this topic is subjective, and as such, this is just my opinion. Your list might be a bit different. If you feel other games deserve that top spot for a specific year, let me know in the comments below. Anyways, it's time. Let's talk about the best games for every year from 1989 to 2024. To start this list off, we have Easebook 1 and 2, released in 1989 for the PC Engine. This is where the Legendary series began. Did you know these games were originally supposed to be a single game, but since they were so large, they had to be separated into two separate titles? Ease is one of my favorite series. It's just on a whole different level with the gameplay and the music. As opposed to current Ease titles, Ease 1 and 2 employed a bump system where instead of pressing a button to swing your sword, like you do in Crystallis or Zelda, you just walk into the enemy until they fall down. It sounds incredibly simple and boring, but it really has such a unique feel and it works really well. As long as you don't just rush in head on and instead hit enemies on an angle. Ease 1 still has the worst final boss in any game I have ever played. So many deaths. So many frustrations. With that being said though, Ease 1 and 2 are fantastic games, and as long as you can deal with dated graphics and gameplay, I'm sure you too will love it. Dragon Quest 4, released in 1990 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. A Dragon Quest game so early on in this list? Absolutely. And it won't be the last time Dragon Quest is featured in this video. Dragon Quest 4 was pretty revolutionary for its time with how the story played out. The first half of the game plays out in several chapters, where each chapter you play as a different character. Some better thought out than others. For example, you have characters like Ragnar, where you only have the attack command, or Tornico, despite how great of a character he is, you literally just play a shopkeeper. Or you have Elena, or the dancers chapters, where they're incredibly fun. As a whole, Dragon Quest IV was a fantastic game, and I still hope that, to this day, we get a trilogy consisting of Dragon Quest IV to VI. Strangely enough, at the current moment, the best way to play Dragon Quest IV is through the mobile version. With that being said, Dragon Quest IV is worth playing, even if it does have some crazy pacing issues. You can hear the baseline of the battle theme now, can't you? Did you ever notice that most Final Fantasy games up until VI have the exact same baseline for their battle themes? You're welcome. Now you'll never be able to unhear it. Anyways, Final Fantasy IV, originally released for the Super Nintendo in 1991, is an absolute classic. It's amongst one of my favorite Final Fantasy games. It's not without its drawbacks, of course, like every game, but I still love it all the same. Honestly, Final Fantasy IV probably has one of the best casts in any Final Fantasy game. Even though this game seems to have fake deaths out the wazoo, even some that don't make any sense. To this day, I still don't understand how Sid can hold a bomb, blow himself up, and just come out of it with a little bit of a headache. Other than that, and Cecil's character development stopping all of a sudden at Mount Ordeals, Final Fantasy IV is an amazing game that everyone needs to play at some point. Lunar the Silver Star, released in 1992 for the Sega CD. 
Now, I'll be completely honest, I haven't played Lunar the Silver Star on the Sega CD. I've only played the complete port on PlayStation 1. Whenever somebody asks me what my favorite video game series are, Lunar is way up there. Lunar is just a beautiful series, and the first game is fantastic. It also seems to get re-releases everywhere, which honestly for Sega titles is uncommon. Lunar 1 has received releases on Sega CD, Sega Saturn, PlayStation, PC, as well as iOS and Android. And on top of that, it's received several versions that all differ slightly, notably Lunar Legend on the Game Boy Advance and Silver Star Harmony on the PSP. Lunar follows the story of Alex on his journey to be like his hero Dragon Master Dine and become a Dragon Master himself. Being joined with his friends Ramus and Luna, to this day I still adore Wind's Nocturne, also known as Luna's Boat Song. It's still one of the sweetest and most relaxing full vocal audio songs in any game I've ever played. Lunar is such a great adventure and modern JRPGs just don't hit the same after playing it. Breath of Fire, released in 1993 for the Super Nintendo. What happened Capcom? Breath of Fire was one of your most beloved IPs, and now it's devolved to a mobile gadget title that only lasted a year, and nothing's been done with the IP since. No ports, no new games, nothing. It's awful. Anyways, enough ranting at Capcom for silly business decisions. Breath of Fire is quite a straightforward JRPG, Nothing super complicated about it, standard turn-based combat, standard towns, progression is exactly what you'd expect. But it has dragons. Cool dragon transformations that no other game has really matched. Breath of Fire was one of those games I didn't play until several years after it was released. I really wish we could get something to do with the series again. Sure, Breath of Fire Dragon Quarter was questionable, but could you imagine if Capcom went back to basics and created a new Breath of Fire like the first four games? The JRPG community would be up in arms and screaming in joy. I'd even accept a collection or even individual re-releases at this point. I miss Breath of Fire. I want to adventure with Ryu and Nina again. Ah, my personal favorite Lunar game. Lunar 2, released in 1994 for the Sega CD. Have you ever played a perfect JRPG? This game actually made my list of JRPGs that are a 10 out of 10. Like the first game in the series, Lunar 2 is on a whole other level when it comes to JRPGs. The cast is spectacular, even if Hero does instantly fall in love with Lucia for next to no reason. Jean is possibly the strongest female character in any JRPG I have ever seen, both physically and emotionally. Emma Steer has some of the best voice lines ever. You don't get very many characters asking you to sample their goods or telling you that you need a spanking very often in JRPGs. Unfortunately, Unlike Lunar the Silver Star, Lunar 2 doesn't get all that many re-releases. It's only been released on Sega CD, Sega Saturn in Japan, and PlayStation 1. I would be so happy with just a PlayStation Plus Classics release, or a Lunar Collection, much like Grandia got. Maybe one day it'll happen, this is another game that people just need to play because it's honestly at the top of JRPG experiences. Quick, what is your favorite game of all time, and why is it Chrono Trigger? Anyways, Chrono Trigger released in 1995 for the Super Nintendo. I feel like Chrono Trigger is just one of those games that inspired a whole generation of JRPG fans. It's a game that does everything right, a wonderful story, great time travel, a fantastic score of music, and characters that play off of each other incredibly well. Furthermore, Chrono Trigger has an effect even on developers today. A lot of these new pixel art or retro style JRPGs seem to be inspired by Chrono Trigger. Did you play Sea of Stars or I Am Setsuna? Those are absolutely 100% Chrono Trigger inspired, especially when you look at the team attacks being so similar to Chrono Trigger's. I don't say this like it's a bad thing. Chrono Trigger is just that amazing. It honestly isn't a surprise that Chrono Trigger is so good. 
After all, it has a dream team consisting of Akira Toriyama of Dragon Ball fame, Nobuo Yuimatsu for Final Fantasy's compositions, Yuji Horii from Dragon Quest, and Hironobu Sakaguchi from Final Fantasy. With talent like this, Chrono Trigger being a hit was pretty much a guarantee. Super Mario RPG Released in 1996 for the Super Nintendo. Hold up, Mario? On an RPG list? No way, that's a platformer. I'm sure that's what was going through my mind when Mario got an RPG game in 1996. Super Mario RPG at first glance might seem like nothing but a cash grab, but honestly, it's commonly up there as people's favorite JRPGs of all time. I often hear it compared to Final Fantasy VI for the top spot of Super Nintendo JRPGs. Personally, I didn't play Super Mario RPG until 2010 or so, and I actually recently played the remake on the Switch that got released in 2023. It's amazing that you can basically do a one-to-one -one remake of a game, and it is still loved just as much as it was originally. I personally really love how it's just a turn-based RPG, but the humor is amazing and the time button presses actually give a little bit of depth to the game. Well, at least until you do what you can to get 100 super jumps consecutively and then just give up because you're stressing way more than you need to for a piece of armor that isn't even needed to finish the main game as the game is pretty easy. Okay, maybe a little bit of animosity there, stupid piece of armor I couldn't get. Anyways, play Super Mario RPG. It might look like a childish game, but it's really, really fun. Okay. I would probably get executed if I didn't mention Final Fantasy VII, released in 1997 for the PlayStation. In 1997, it had a huge amount of competition. Other games I was considering for the 1997 slot of this list were Final Fantasy Tactics, Tales of Destiny, and Grandia, just to name a few. Final Fantasy VII was an absolute juggernaut of a title, not only because of how amazing the game was, but I would single-handedly give Final Fantasy VII credit for making JRPGs relevant in the West. JRPGs did exist before Final Fantasy VII, but it was more of a niche genre in the West. If you were a JRPG fan before 1997, every time a JRPG game was announced, it was a nervous crapshoot whether or not the West would see that game localized. So thank you, Square. Thank you for allowing JRPGs to thrive in the West. As for Final Fantasy VII itself, what makes this game so great? Well, other than what I've already mentioned as far as for what it's done for the genre, the materia system was fantastic, allowing an incredible amount of customization that wasn't necessarily seen before. Not to mention some of the most fantastic characters still to this day. Aerith, am I right? Oh, I'm sorry. Eris. I'm sure everyone that has even heard of RPGs has played this before, but just in case you haven't, what's wrong with you? Go play it. You will not regret it. Star Ocean The Second Story, released in 1998 for the original PlayStation. I'll be completely honest, I am a bit biased towards Star Ocean 2. Star Ocean 2 was the first Trius game I ever played which, to this day, is one of my favorite developers. Star Ocean 2 was great for a few reasons. First of all, you have the choice of two different protagonists, which not only changes the perspective that the story is told from, but it also changes which characters you can recruit. Recruiting characters is another feature of Star Ocean 2. There are 13 available characters, some exclusive to specific storylines, however, you can only recruit 8 in a single playthrough. It's impossible to get all the characters, which gives the game a ton of replay value. Star Ocean 2 also has one of the only item creation systems that I actually enjoy. Why? Because it's incredibly easy to break the game. Wanna hit level 99 like 12 hours into the game? Well, item creation in Star Ocean 2 makes it worth it. Star Ocean 2 is just an amazing game, and the remake released in 2023 makes it even better. Honestly, it's one of the best games I've ever played, and I don't say that lightly. Please, if you get the chance, enjoy the greatness that is Star Ocean 2. Legend of Mana, released for the PlayStation in 1999. Believe it or not, Legend of Mana is not a mainline mana title even though it deserves to be the fourth mana title way more than that travesty that is Donna Mana. Wanna see my roast of Donna Mana? Well, I've actually reviewed the game, so maybe check that out after you're done here. 
Legend of Mana is a bit of a different beast when it comes to mana games. It's more of a 2D beat-em-up style brawler that features an interesting item creation system that sort of mana adopted as well as a system where you have to rebuild the world. I know the game isn't all that loved, but personally I really like that game. Legend of Mana has charm and I love the fact that every single weapon in the game has different special moves. On top of that, all the different movement abilities that you're capable of the game just feels great to play, and the NPCs have got to be some of the best NPCs in any game I've ever played. It's honestly a really fun game, and it's underappreciated. That being said, it did get a remaster. Shockingly. Seriously, it was the last game I expected to get a remaster. So if you have a PlayStation 4, Switch, or PC, you can play this absolutely gorgeous remaster. Heck, it's even on mobile if that's more your jam. Honestly, you have no excuse not to play it now. Seriously, give it a chance. It may not be a mainline title, but it's 100% worth your time. Grandia 2, released in 2000 for the Sega Dreamcast. Whoa, a Sega Dreamcast JRPG? Yeah. Grandia 2 is a spectacular and amazing JRPG. I actually didn't get the chance to play this game until the PlayStation 2, but I still adored it all the same. Grandia 2 stars the Geo Hound. Ryudo, along with his trusty hawk sidekick, Sky. Sky, he's a character. He talks for some reason. Probably a Disney reject. But anyways, when he does talk, he's very sarcastic. It makes for some thrilling comedy. I can say that much for sure. Grandia 2 is amazing at portraying the feeling of adventure, and has a fantastic turn-based combat system. Personally though, well, I thought the first game was better, but Grandia 2 is still a solid game in its own right. Luckily, it's not all that hard to play these days, as there is an HD remaster on, well, literally everything. PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, PC, pick your poison. I've yet to play the remaster, but I full on intend to soon. After all, I've reviewed the first game, so it's only natural to review the second, right? Hopefully, I can get to that soon. Not only for the channel, but because it's been way too long since I've played Grandia 2. And I think it's time to revisit it. After all, that's what this channel was made for, right? To revisit classics from my childhood and share my thoughts on them now. It's been interesting to see what I think of games now in my current mindset as opposed to how I felt when I played them 15 to 20 years ago. Anyways, Grandia 2 is a unique experience with fantastic characters and it's perfect for anyone that enjoys a great JRPG. Golden Sun, released for the Game Boy Advance in 2001. Everyone knows about Golden Sun, right? Easily one of the best JRPGs on the Game Boy Advance. Golden Sun kinda has a job system, and it's not a surprise at this point that I adore job systems. And while Golden Sun doesn't have a conventional job system, it's still a temporary job system? Regardless, I love Golden Sun, and it has what could possibly be considered Matoi Sakuraba's best battle theme he has ever conceived. This is also quite the praise, as Sakuraba constantly puts out bangers. Funny thing about Golden Sun, I haven't actually finished it. I love the game, but I haven't actually gotten to the end. I don't have an excuse why. It has everything I love in a JRPG. Puzzles, great turn-based combat, and a wonderful world to explore. I'm still holding out hope that Golden Sun gets the 2D HD treatment. It's great that Golden Sun got released on the Nintendo Switch Online service, but unfortunately, the game looks terrible blown up. This game needs to be cleaned up with maybe a few quality of life changes. Seriously. Why does a game not have auto-retargeting? Maybe it'll happen one day, but until then, it's stuck on the Game Boy Advance and Nintendo Switch. Xenosaga Episode 1 Released for the PlayStation 2 in 2002 Do you remember Xenosaga? I was honestly super cautious about starting this game. I heard the stories. I heard it was worse than the Metal Gear Solid franchise when it comes to cutscenes. And they weren't kidding. Xenosaga has so many cutscenes. I think it's the only game I've played where you get several save points to break up the cutscenes. That being said, Xenosaga is great. The story is fantastic, and the gameplay, well, it's slow as molasses in the dead of winter, but it's still a very, very good game. The minigames were great, and the skill system was a lot of fun as well. But honestly, Xenosaga is a game that has a story that makes everything worth it. 
This is another series that I really wish had a remaster, though I'm a bit upset that due to the failure of Xenosaga Episode 2, the series got cut from 6 games to only 3. I know Harada of Namco Bandai said that there isn't any interest for remasters of this series, but every time I see people being asked what they want a remaster of, the Xenosaga series shows up more often than not. This just doesn't add up, Harada. It doesn't add up. Maybe one day, all we as a fanbase need to do is band together and make it happen one day. Tales of Symphonia Released for the GameCube in 2003, the Final Fantasy VII of the Tales series. What I mean by this is it's everyone's first Tales game, or at least most people that were into the JRPG scene in 2003. I know I've expressed my frustration for Tales of Symphonia due to it changing the battle system from a 2D plane to a 3D plane, but that doesn't mean it isn't an amazing game worthy of all sorts of praise. Tales of Symphonia deserves recognition for bringing the Tales series into the limelight and the beginning of making it a more known series in the West. Other reasons that I think Tales of Symphonia deserves to be thought of as the best game of 2003 is because that soundtrack, the art style that still looks banging to this day, and just some really nice characters. I still think Colette is adorable, and Rain is... well, she's crazy, but that's not always a bad thing. If you're interested in my in-depth thoughts, I actually reviewed Tales of Symphonia a few months back. It was the first time I had played through the game in over 10 years or so, and it's still as great as the first time I played it. Give it a shot. It just might turn you into a full-fledged Tales fan. Dragon Quest VIII, released for the PlayStation 2 in 2004. Dragon Quest is a series that has always been near and dear to my heart. In fact, my very first game I ever played was the original Dragon Quest on the NES. Dragon Quest VIII was such a huge change, and I thank this game for giving Dragon Quest some popularity in the West. Dragon Quest was relatively niche in the West until the 8th entry, Though, I don't know if that was because of how beautiful the game looks, or the fact that it shipped with a demo of Final Fantasy XII. Of course, it's entirely possible that it's because of Jessica in her tube top dress. Oh well, we shall never know. It was actually Jessica. Let's not kid ourselves. Regardless, whatever it was, I'm super glad that Dragon Quest has become second only Final Fantasy as far as hype for JRPGs goes. Dragon Quest VIII honestly kinda threw me off. I was so used to top-down pixel graphics and the first-person battles, but Dragon Quest VIII used 3D models, and you can actually see your heroes attacking. You know that worry when developers give in and do whatever they can to make it appeal to the masses, usually resulting in a drop in quality? Luckily, that didn't happen with Dragon Quest VIII. Even until today with Dragon Quest XI, Dragon Quest still feels like a really pretty NES game right down to the mechanics and gameplay style. That being said, Dragon Quest VIII is still many people's favorite in the series. Seriously, play it. Right now. Go play it. You won't regret it. Ease, The Oath in Falgana, initially released for PC in Japan in 2005. Here we are, talking about one of my favorite games of all time. Ease, The Oath in Falgana was my first Ease game, and moreover, my first Falcom game. I still adore this game to this day, and thankfully, The Oath and Falgana is available on almost every current system. Sorry, Xbox owners. Anyways, Ease The Oath and Falgana is a remake of Ease 3 for the PC Engine, and it uses my favorite gameplay format of the Ease series. I just love the platforming style of Ease games. Not to say the party system used in Ease 8 or the bump system used in Ease 1 and 2 is bad. But the platforming just gives a Metroidvania-style gameplay system with new traversal abilities and the like. Even beyond the gameplay, Adol and Dogi are just amazing characters. And the music in Oath and Falgana possibly has one of the best Falcom soundtracks ever conceived. Or possibly one of the best gaming soundtracks in existence. Okay, there might be a little bit of fanboy coming out here. But give the soundtrack a listen, it's beautiful and has rock undertones which makes it a treat for the ears. The soundtrack is all over Spotify and YouTube, it's well worth a listen. Okay, I better cut talking about Oath and Valgana right now because I could be fanboying over this for an hour straight. With that being said, on to 2006. Blue Dragon, released for the Xbox 360 in 2006. 
not only is this one of my favorite job systems ever introduced in gaming, though Final Fantasy X-2 and Bravely Default come close, it has the wonderful artwork of the late Akira Toriyama. I've heard people saying that this is a spiritual successor to Chrono Trigger. Now, I'm not sure how true that is, but even if it isn't, the game is fantastic. Sure, the story is a bit basic, you're playing as a bunch of young kids, and the game is incredibly simple, which may make it seem like it's a game designed for children, but it's still super fun and deserves to be played. Job systems are my favorite mechanic of any JRPG, and the fact that this allows an incredible amount of customization lets you play the game different in every single playthrough. Lack of replayability is something that just comes along naturally with RPGs, but letting you come up with different strategies for battle breathes a bit of fresh air into each playthrough. And don't even get me started on that boss theme. It's pure gold, I tell you. Pure gold. Crisis Core, Final Fantasy VII, released for the PSP in 2007. Crisis Core was a prequel to Final Fantasy VII that told Zack's story and in turn, Cloud's origin story. Honestly, Crisis Core, I was a bit skeptical on. An action RPG, but not even a very responsive action RPG. And on top of that, why is it on a portable console? Disgusting. Disgusting. Though, I was surprised with how fun the game was. Materia Fusion was a blast, and you can create utterly broken combinations that absolutely destroy any sort of difficulty. 999 plus percent HP, anyone? Break damage limit with costly punch, perhaps? It's a lot of fun to destroy bosses in a single hit. Oh no, it's Sephiroth. I hope he doesn't kill me instead. Oh, he's dead. Okay then, if you are interested in giving this game a shot, I wouldn't suggest the PSP version. Crisis Core did get a remaster or remake on pretty much everything, which smooths out the combat, makes it feel more action-y, along with being much more graphically pleasing. Though, regardless of which version of the game you decide to play, make sure you bring some tissues. If you've played Final Fantasy VII, you know exactly what's going to happen at the end, and the music along with what happens breaks me every single time. It's sad, it's emotional, but if you get the same feelings every time you play it, that's a sign of a great story and a great game, isn't it? Persona 4, released for the PlayStation 2 in 2008. I feel like this was probably most people's first Persona game, and the first gateway into the Shin Megami Tensei series. It's funny, when I first played this game, I thought it was dark. I had never experienced a JRPG with such foreboding and aggressive themes. Up to this point, most games I played were more fantasy-esque and happy-go-lucky. Then this game starts with somebody hanging from a telephone wire dead in the morning. It was such a huge shock to me that a game would go so far as to actually show someone in a state like that. With more experience as far as Shin Megami Tensei goes, I know now that this game is one of the more tame ones, and is basically Scooby-Doo Mysteries if it was a JRPG, but when I first played Persona 4, I adored it. Persona 4 was really unique, and honestly I'm glad it took off, because Persona has since taken off in popularity thanks to the fourth entry. The series is now at that point where it's insanely popular and possibly one of the most go-to franchises when people mention JRPGs. Valkyrie Profile Covenant of a Plume, released for the Nintendo DS in 2009. I will be completely honest, 2009 was sort of a weak year. There really wasn't anything worthwhile released this year. Artemelco 2, Kingdom Hearts 358 by 2 days. Still no idea how that is even supposed to be pronounced. Anyways, those two were a few others that I was considering mentioning for the year of 2009. Covenant of the Plume was an interesting twist on the Valkyrie Profile series. The series has always changed with each release slightly, from a turn-based to semi-turn-based, and now a strategy RPG. But the core gameplay has always stayed the same. You use each of the four face buttons to attack with one party member and Covenant of the Plume is no different. You just have to make sure you have four characters in range when you decide to attack. Though Covenant of the Plume has one mechanic that I know a lot of people weren't a fan of. You can sacrifice one of your Iron Harry art to gain ridiculous stats. When I say ridiculous, I do mean ridiculous. I'm not talking boosting your stats by a few hundred or so, but several thousands. Unfortunately, this mechanic perma-kills one of your party members, and on later maps, 
it's mandatory to win. Regardless of that, I loved it, and at the very least, it's better than that heaving pile of corpses known as Valkyrie Elysium. Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, released in 2010 for the PSP. This is tied with Kingdom Hearts 2 for my favorite Kingdom Hearts game of all time. Birth by Sleep focuses on the story of Terra, Ventus, and Aqua, and is the distant prequel to the whole series telling the events of the Keyblade War and how it came to be. I'm sure the story of Kingdom Hearts really isn't a selling point, because at this point, it's a cluster of non-coherent hullabaloo, unless you play every game, mobile title, read every backstory, and probably play tabletop games that do or do not exist. But it's still an enjoyable time, with some of the best worlds, even if they're incredibly short. I also really love Aqua as a character, and seeing how this is the game that introduced her, you know I had to talk about it. Birth by Sleep introduced the command melding system, somewhat similar to the aforementioned Crisis Core of Materia Fusion. You could create commands, and then combine these commands to create even stronger commands. This felt like such a unique action RPG, and it was absolutely worth buying a PSP for. And that's a true story. I bought my PSP solely to play Birth by Sleep, and I don't regret it for a second. Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch, released in 2011 for the PlayStation 3. I'll take best PlayStation 3 game for 500, Alex. Seriously, Nino Kuni was such a huge shock when it came out. It had an amazing Ghibli art style, an amazing soundtrack, and it starts off in a way that completely destroys your heart. Nino Kuni was another one of those games that just felt super unique, and unlike a huge amount of the PlayStation 3 library, it didn't follow the trend of PS3's brown and muddy graphics. Nino Kuni looked like you were playing a legitimate anime. In fact, it felt as if you were watching an interactive Studio Ghibli movie. Not only graphically, but the soundtrack felt like it was right out of Howl's Moving Castle or something. Which, by the way, is totally the best Studio Ghibli movie. Fight me! But seriously, what's your favorite Studio Ghibli movie? Let me know in the comments below. As I was saying, everything about Nino Kuni is beautiful. Don't write it off as being childish based on the graphics, because you will be missing out on one of the best JRPGs of the generation. <laughs> Look, it's one of my favorite games of all time. Bravely Default, released for the Nintendo 3DS in 2012. What can I say about Bravely Default that I haven't already? Bravely Default is bloody brilliant. Amazing characters, long live the goat ring a bell, such a chad. A soundtrack that has yet to be matched, and graphics, okay, they're lackluster. I still don't understand why no one has a nose. Come on, Square Enix. But the best part about Bravely Default is that glorious battle system. I adore job systems, and Bravely Default has one of the best. So much customizations, and so many broken builds. I don't think I can ever get sick of this game. Do I sound like a fanboy? Yeah. Good, because I won't lie, I totally am. I still hope that one of these days, Bravely Default and Second get remastered for the Switch, or whatever Nintendo's new console is. It's honestly a crime that the first two Bravely titles are locked to the 3DS at the time of this video. They need to be made to be more readily available. The Legend of Heroes Trails of Cold Steel, released for the PlayStation Vita and PlayStation 3 in 2013. Honestly, as much as I am lukewarm to the Trails of Cold Steel art, it's thanks to the protagonist Reen and the whole existence of Cold Steel that Legend of Heroes gained such a following here in the West. Sure, we had Trails in the Sky, but it was a very under the radar series until Cold Steel brought the series to the eyes of the mainstream. Trails of Cold Steel follows the story of Reen and the rest of Class 7 as they attend Thor's military academy in the vast country of Erebonia. With as much crap as I give Cold Steel, it's not a terrible game or a series, but it is iconic as far as the Trail series goes. And personal opinions aside, it really is a great game. Even if I find the main hero Reen as deep and reliable as a cardboard box in a rainstorm. You'd be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't experience Cold Steel on the rest of the Trails series. Besides, it has giant mechs. Who doesn't like giant mechs? I like mechs. You should like mechs. And that neighbor of yours, they should also like mechs. Especially when they have giant katanas of destruction. Tales of Zillia 2, released in 2014 for the PlayStation 3. 
Now, yes, before you get all huffy about this, I understand it was released in Japan in 2012, but I'm making an exception for this one. Tales of Zillia 2 was a direct sequel to the original Tales of Zillia released in 2013. It's not uncommon to hear that Tales of Zillia 2 is people's favorite Tales game, which doesn't surprise me. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Tales games after they went to the 3D battle system, but Zillia 2 is 100% an exception. The new main protagonist, Ludger, has to be one of the most fun characters to play in any Tales game. He has three different styles of combat. He fights with dual swords, dual handguns, and a giant hammer, and you can swap between them as you see fit, even mid-combo. It feels super satisfying to jump between weapon sets and skills in the middle of a combo. It's super stylish, it's super fun, and all of the original heroes return in this game as playable characters, as well as the villains Musei and Gaius. Speaking of Tales, anyone find it odd that we still don't have information of the successor to Tales of Arise? Hopefully soon, because I'm starving for a new Tales game. Tales is one of the best action RPG series, am I right? Undertale, released for, well, literally everything in 2015. If there was one game that everyone has heard of, it would have to be Undertale, right? This game is incredibly popular, and there are memes for it everywhere. I actually didn't play Undertale until 2021, and it was one of those games that made me question why I hadn't played it yet. Undertale looks incredibly simple, almost like a Newgrounds Flash game. Do you remember Newgrounds? Good times. Anyways, Undertale is very monochrome as far as the art style goes, but the story is where it really shines. I love how the game makes you care about the characters, and the idea of having your ending rely on if you kill enemies or not is genius. To this day, I have only done a pacifist run. I do want to do a genocide run at some point, but that sounds so brutal, doesn't it? Genocide is literally where you kill every random encounter in the game which leads to probably one of the most amazing modern day battle themes in existence. You can hear it right now, can't you? In the back of your mind, Megalovania. Of course you can. That's the music in the background. Anyways, that being said, Undertale is super unique and it actually spawned a sequel series called Delta Room. I haven't touched that yet as I'm waiting for it to be complete, but even then, Play Undertale, so you can cry like the rest of us. World of Final Fantasy, released for the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita in 2016, and for other consoles down the line. World of Final Fantasy was such a great fan service game. First of all, the chibi art style is super adorable. You can summon old Final Fantasy characters like Cloud and Squall, and it lets you capture monsters like a Pokemon game and stack them on top of each other to create a totally unique party member. It was such a strange concept for a Final Fantasy game, but I'm all for it. At first glance, this might look like a childish take on the RPG genre, but is that really such a problem? The only childish thing about this game is the art style and Tama. Tama. Their speech patterns drive me up the freaking wall. Their speech patterns drive the me up the freaking the wall. Other than that, World of Final Fantasy is an incredibly cute experience and is just one of those games you just don't take seriously and just play because you want a lighthearted and fun time. Sure, the story has its dark moments, but in the end, it's just nice and fun. Later on in 2018, World of Final Fantasy released a paid update titled World of Final Fantasy Maxima, which added new characters to recruit, as well as new legacy characters to summon. I haven't actually played the Rue Maxima at this point, I should probably get to that soon. Dragon Quest XI released in 2017 for the PlayStation 4. I love, love, love Dragon Quest XI. It's up there as one of my favorite RPGs of all time, but that's not a surprise, right? Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest is consistently putting out amazing titles, so the fact that it's still wonderful now isn't a surprise. What can I say about Dragon Quest XI that hasn't already been said? It's constantly on the top RPG of all time lists. It's gorgeous. It's got a familiar but somewhat unique battle system. That gorgeous Akira Toriyama art style and beautiful colors out the wazoo. Dragon Quest XI is just great. And the only negative thing I can say about it 
is that we didn't ever get the 3DS port like they did in Japan. Luckily, later on down the line, when the Definitive Edition got released in North America and Europe, the additional content that was exclusive to the 3DS version got released worldwide. This extra content is amazing. You can play the whole game in a 2D art style, like classic Dragon Quest, and it lets you travel to and revisit Dragon Quest world from previous Dragon Quest titles. This is possibly one of the best JRPGs on the PlayStation 4, and it should be on everyone's bucket list to play at least once. It might sound as if I'm overselling it, but honestly, it's worthy of all this praise. You won't be disappointed. Trust me. Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology, released in 2018 for the 3DS. Yeah, yeah, I know, I said only original releases, but hear me out. Perfect Chronology added enough extra content as well as it's just that great of a game that it deserves to be talked about. Perfect Chronology is a remaster of the game of the same name released in 2010. You know what a difficult concept to get right in any sort of media is? Time travel. More often than not, it ends up causing strange loopholes that don't make sense, creates alternate realities, and kind of just follows its own rules. Well. Radiant Historia kind of leans into that and intentionally creates different timelines for the sake of story. It's actually done really well and in the sense that you can return to a previous point in the timeline and alter a decision that you may have made in order to have a different outcome. For example, at one point there's a literal branching path. One path safety and the other a nation's entire military that leads to a character's death. So naturally, if you go down the road to where your friend gets killed, you open your book, go back to before you chose the wrong path, and then choose the right one. However, in doing this, it creates an alternate timeline. I love this sort of mechanic because it lets you see all sorts of outcomes and gives your decisions real meaning, kind of like how the Zero Escape games do it, which is totally a game series you should play. Seriously, it's about the same level as awesome as Danganronpa. Radiant Historia is honestly one of the better DS and 3DS RPGs and I feel everyone should give it a shot. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure you will too. I'm giving you my personal guarantee. Ease 9 Monstrum Nox, released in 2019. Oh hey, another entry from one of my favorite series of all time. Ease 9 Monstrum Nox is an action RPG, and what a great one it is. I know it doesn't get all that much for positivity, especially after coming from the legendary Ease 8, Lacrimosa of Donna. However, it is still fantastic in its own right. Not to mention, it's like the Wild Arms 5 of the franchise, in the sense that it has all sorts of callbacks of previous games in the series, even the dreaded Ease 5. In fact, Ease 5 leads into a major plot point of Ease 9. Sure, Ease 9 didn't exactly have the same adventure feel, and you're very limited on where you can go, or what you can do depending on how far into the story you are. But honestly, ease is ease, and every entry in the franchise is great. There's just something about a fast-paced and fun action RPG that's accompanied by fantastic music that makes this whole series an incredibly fun time. The addition of each character's gift makes exploring in Ease 9 so much fun. You can climb up walls, get a zip line, a shadow step to go under low walls, and so much more. Luckily, Ease 9 is on every piece of modern hardware, so you don't have any excuse not to play it. Go on, get. Okay, got it downloading? Excellent, we can move on to 2020. Yakuza Like a Dragon, released in 2020. Okay, let me preface this by saying I have not yet played Yakuza 7. However, from what I've seen in Let's Plays and live streams, as well as my friend never shutting up about how great the game is, I couldn't not talk about Yakuza Like a Dragon for the year of 2020. So, like a Dragon is where the series went from a JRPG adjacent beat em up with JRPG elements to a full on turn based JRPG with a literal job system. I know a lot of people are skeptical about this change because of how aggressive and violent each Yakuza game has been up to this point. Along with the ridiculousness of the sub stories of the Yakuza series, people were worried that this style of game wouldn't translate well to a turn based RPG. However, Yakuza 7 seemed to skyrocket the series into popularity. This is really a game that I want to play, and I will eventually, once I catch up to it in the series. Currently I'm on Yakuza 3, and hopefully by this time next year I'll be able to play this one and be able to give more detail on how exciting it is. 
It'll probably result in a review, so look forward to that. Shin Megami Tensei 5, released for the Nintendo Switch in 2021. Now, this is the original release that was a Nintendo Switch exclusive, not the Vengeance release that was released for everything in 2024. The mainline Shin Megami Tensei series is something that I really want to get into. I've played this one, but I haven't touched Shin Megami Tensei 1-4 yet. I hear really positive things about them, and about how they're some of the hardest turn-based RPGs to ever exist. That intrigues me. I'm always down for a difficult JRPG. I had a lot of fun with Shin Megami Tensei 5, and it scratched that monster collecting itch I had, and I love getting stronger and stronger demons. This also features the fusing system that you see in Persona, so honestly it was a perfect game to me. What I noticed is Shin Megami Tensei 5 is much more gameplay oriented than the Persona games are. It was way nicer to just have a game with short and sweet cutscenes that just push you into the next open world as opposed to Persona where you go through one dungeon, then spend the next 10 hours doing social link quests. While I love social links, sometimes you just want to fight demons and get to that action. I can't wait to start Vengeance actually. Sure, I've played the original, but I hear the new plotline is really well done. Soon. I'll play it soon. I promise. Triangle Strategy, released in 2022 for the Nintendo Switch and later on PC. Seriously, can Team Asano go wrong? Everything they do is perfect. Constantly putting a- Oh, I don't think so, Various Daylife. Get out of here. You know the entire world likes to pretend that even in a hundred thousand alternate realities you don't exist. Go away, you hopeless abomination of a video game. Alright, what was I talking about again? Oh yeah, Triangle Strategy. Triangle Strategy is a strategy RPG done by Team Asano, who you may know for Bravely Default, Octopath Traveler, and the Live Alive remake. Triangle Strategy was interesting, a really fun tactics ogre style game in that beautiful HD 2D art style. Now, I haven't finished the game myself at this point, but I've played a decent amount into the game and I've loved every moment of it. Though, that being said, my only critique of the game is that the cutscenes can be a tad bit too long at times, making me wish the game would just get on with it, so you can get to that wonderful gameplay segment. Other than that though, it's a fantastic game, and it should definitely be played by anyone that loves a good political strategy RPG. Sea of Stars, released in 2023. Do you love Chrono Trigger? Do you miss the days of Super Nintendo RPGs? How about timing-based battle systems? Well then, Sea of Stars is the game for you. Act now and we'll give you a second copy, abso- Sorry about that. Every now and then, the spirit of Billy Mays likes to possess me. Seriously though, Sea of Stars is the perfect definition of nostalgia bait. If you grew up playing games like Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy 4 through 6, or really any sprite-based RPG in the 1990s, this game will be absolutely perfect for you. Sea of Stars was developed through the power of Kickstarter, and it was designed to bring back that feeling that Super Nintendo JRPGs gave you. It has fantastic music, a great battle system, and the characters? Okay, the main character is kind of lame, but Garl is awesome and the game? It's still fantastic. I played through this on my vacation in 2023, and it was a lot of fun from start to finish. The only real thing that I'd complain about for this game is the fact that the battle system kind of peaks like one to two hours into the game. Maybe if characters got a few new special moves and the break system wasn't impossible to complete 90% of the time, I would have given it a perfect 10. That being said, I adored Sea of Stars and it actually brought me out of a gaming funk. I highly suggest that you give it a shot if you need that retro JRPG itch scratch. Here we are, 2024. It's the current year, and this year we've had so many amazing games out, it's really difficult just to pick just one. There have been tons of games that have come out, and still a ton more scheduled to come out for the rest of the year. However, so far for this year, the best game that I have to pick is Trails Through Daybreak. Now, at this time I haven't finished it, but so far, it's been an absolute blast. I love the new character Vamp. He's old, he's gloomy, he can transform into a demon, he's not Reen. Sorry, I had to. The gameplay is much more streamlined, side quests don't seem to overwhelm the main story as bad as they used to, and that battle system? Love it. 
Trails Through Daybreak so far is looking to be the best game in the series, and that's really saying something as the Trails series has some of the best games over the last 20 years. I can't wait to finish it, and once I do, I expect a review. So keep an eye out for that. Whoa, mama. <laughs> this is by far the biggest project I've ever taken on for YouTube. Anyways, there you have it. 35 years and 35 great JRPGs from each of those years. Did I mention your favorite? And if not, which ones do you feel should have been mentioned? Let me know in the comments below. Once again, I just want to say thank you for joining me on this YouTube journey, and here's to another 1000 everyone. I appreciate you all so much. If you're new here and enjoyed what you saw today, don't be afraid to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ding that notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. If you're still interested in watching more of my videos, like this video. It's probably something that you'll enjoy. This has been Shinky. Thanks so much for watching everyone, and as always, have a wonderful day.